Good morning, good morning. Hold on. Be right, just checking something. Hold on, be right there. I mean, I'm there, you're there. Uh, hold on, little thing here. Okay, Um. so he, yes, good morning. Right. So good morning, well, let's see. First, I'm starting visual here. Good morning, Vicky. Good morning, Gabriel. Good morning, Mariam. Ooh, look at this, interesting. It almost looks like a proton or something. Good morning, Vanita. Good morning, Jocelyn. All right, that's the visuals. Now, chat-wise, good morning, Vicky. Good morning, Jean. Good morning, Gabriel. Good morning, Vanita. Good morning, Melanie. Good morning, Jocelyn. Good morning, Miriam. Good morning, Vincent. There's Vitz. There's, all right, we got a lot of animation going on now. Remember, there's a new portal for that. Good morning, Gabriel and Vincent and Vicky for the highly um, energetic uh, um, visuals. Yes. Okay, I, we're going to start in a second. I'm just, Um, sorry, I don't know why. Well, hold on. Um, okay. Okay. Um, Oh, and I'm feeling very well. Thank you. I, I yes, I'm feeling well. I appreciate. I always appreciate the check-ins. Of a little medical update and a logistical update to my. Hang on one second. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. So we're going to get going with new material in a minute. Again, let me let me congratulate all of you. If you are here, I mean, obviously, any of you who is listening to me right now, who's here, has first of all done the right thing by showing up today. It is hard to show up on a day of an exam, especially when the exam is, you know, when you're not sitting for the exam in real time, but you show up anyway. That is a responsible, sometimes very hard, sometimes courageous thing to do, honestly. So first of all, if you are here in the room at all right now, good job. And I'm noticing and I'm pleased. Like, serious, it's not like, you know, I'm not like an attendance taker as such, but I'm definitely taking note of who's here on the day of an exam. Um, and I'm, and I am honestly taking note of who's not. Um, so good for you who are here. Now, also, let me say, and I'm going to move on in a minute because obviously the exams just came in. So of course, you know, of course I haven't looked at them yet. Um, and it may take me a little longer than I wish. I mean, because well, let me because this is a chemo week. Okay. So please bear with me. And then there's other classes with exams too. So bear with me. I will move as fast as I can. But part of the reason that I make so many standards that I do about how you present the document, how you make the document is to try, because I know these are very long documents. So hopefully you did your job in making the documents as inviting and readable for me as possible. So I will do my best, but you're, you're not going to get them back this Wednesday. I can, in fact, but I won't even be here this Wednesday. We'll get to that in a minute, but so just bear with me. Your exams are very important to me. But there's a lot of them and they're very long. So bear with me. Okay. I, they're not anyway, that's number one. Uh, number two, um, I will say this. Well, Well, so number two, there's nothing much more that can be said specifically about the exams right now since you just turned them in, except again, congratulations. Um, they're not easy, I don't think. It's not an easy experience. It's not a fun experience, even if you feel like you know what you're doing. So congratulations on being done, doing the right thing. If, if for whatever reason you happen not to be done, like if you made a personal arrangement with me because something came up and you communicated okay, 
right? And and if you're one of and if, if yeah, and if you're not done and you didn't make an arrangement with me, like obviously that's not great. But and I don't want to get bogged down in that discussion right now. That's not ideal. Um, and there are impacts of that. There are point consequences of that. However, um, I also want to say that if for whatever reason something has happened with your exam and you and I didn't know about it and I wasn't warned, although that is not optimum, and although there will be a reality to that, um, whoever you are, if I'm speaking with you, I, we, you know, you'll talk to me right after or we'll deal with it right after and we'll figure out what's what. And I will say that if you're in that situation that for whatever reason your exam is not done and I didn't know about it before, I do want to say you're definitely all the more doing the courageous and right thing by being here in this class right now. Like that would be a tough decision, I would think. Um, and it's the right decision. And I'm noting that. OK, so again, I don't want to get bogged down right now, but I'm basically here to congratulate anybody who's in the room right now. You're either in the room because you're done. And then I'm definitely, you know, then absolutely congratulations. And you've already done a very hard thing. And before you even worry about what your grade is or before, you know, yeah, before you worry about what your grade is, you should take a moment to pat yourself on the back and say, whew, no matter what, I've done the right thing and I've done my best. And the ball is now in Yaverbaum's court. So until you hear further notice, you are doing as well as possible, like honestly. And it's important that you take a moment and realize that and just like relax today. OK, and again, if you're not done for whatever reason. Whether you made an arrangement with me, which is the right, which is the best thing, or you didn't, which is not the best thing. Either way, if you are here right now, again, let me say then you should congratulate yourself on doing the courageous and correct thing. And if there's an issue at all, you've made it better for yourself and easier on yourself and easier on me by doing the courageous thing and facing the music and being here today. I'm serious about that because believe me, I've been, I personally as a student have been on any end of this spectrum of dealing, with, especially with physics exams, a story for another time. But believe me, after going, being a physics major and then going to graduate school twice, like, don't think that every physics exam for me was a cakewalk, not at all, okay? And often just showing up at all was the hardest possible thing for me to do. And so if you're doing it, you're doing a good thing, really. Okay, now, um, okay, and I'm seeing a bunch of things in the direct chat. I'm just gonna look for a second, but we're gonna, so we're gonna move on now to like new material and, you know, just take notes and you'll get the PDF like, and, and you'll notice there's not even, well, there is homework to Wednesday, actually. It's too bad, but there is. But um, just whatever. I don't mean today to be a stress. Today should be a breathe out day for the most part. Um, I'm just looking in the direct chat. So bear with me for a second. Um, okay. Oh, and my son is called. Hold on a second. Am I, okay. Hold on one sec. Uh, yeah. Okay. Hold on. Okay, uh, so, 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 I mean, and if there are any other logistical questions or any, oh, 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 I'm sorry. Where's the board, where's the board, where's the board? Okay, so logistically also, just as a reminder, uh, just as a reminder, um, so yeah, so I have chemo this week and, and a lot of ancillary related stuff like PET scan, blah, blah, blah. So I will not be here Wednesday. I think you know, well, I will try to remind you in Google Classroom, but this is another one of those Wednesdays where Professor Lou will be here. She'll, she, obviously she has access to Google Classroom. She knows where we are in the curriculum. She'll do it her way. But again, it's um, it's an opportunity to use her to get clarification on the material You know your way. I mean, one of the hugest advantages of having two two professors really is that it doesn't all have to be like, obviously my perspective works better for some of you than for others. So it's great to be able to get professor Lou's 
total different perspective on the same material like that anyway so the main thing that i would focus on if i were you is with her i mean sorry she'll structure it of course but what's due wednesday is the newton's laws assignment which we're going to start newton's laws today and again reminder what you need to do by wednesday is hand in some kind of substantial first attempt, first draft, right? You don't have to finish everything. I feel like it's not the shortest assignment in the world and we're only going to get so far in the material today. So you just have to take an attempt, make an attempt and you don't have to finish everything. You just have to show a, um, a respect to the deadline in order to potentially eventually get all the points. And, I, uh, and let me re reinforce again, there are people in this room right now. Well, there are certainly people in this class Huh. There's a lot of people missing, actually, and I am noting that. Um, but also for the record, so that you know, a lot of people that are missing right now, they totally have turned in their exams. Like, believe me, I'm looking. I, I, and I'm not trying to just don't think that they are now getting an extra hour on their exam or something. If they're doing that, well, they're not. I actually know that they're not. But but I am noting that you guys are here and they're not. Just please. I, I am noting that. Um um, so what's due Wednesday is Newton's laws. Just, uh, oh, and I was about to say, there are some of you who really are taking advantage of this revise, revise, revise allowance in the curriculum. And believe me, that's very noted too. Some of you are doing like, I have done like fourth revisions just to get the last extra three points or something on something. And it, it really makes a difference. It's not just those three points. It really shows me like, wow, it shows me a lot. Um, Okay, I think everybody understands all that. Uh, and if ever there's an assignment that you've gotten back where you didn't get all the points, but you didn't get the feedback yet, which is possible too, because I am starting to fall a little behind. If you have an assignment anywhere where you didn't get all the points, but you don't see the feedback, again, if look at it, see if now you know what to do from class discussion and stuff and just take it upon yourself to assume that I assume that you would see that feedback in the class. But if not, if you're looking at it and you're like, no, I still don't know what he wants me to do. And in fact, I think I've done everything. Like what the what? Possible, possible, just re-upload it again when you get a chance. Just say, Professor, I'm not sure what more you want me to do with this. I feel like it's done. And and and, and I will then either give you feedback or I'll give you all the points. I mean, I'll look at, it, okay? Anyway, that's like the system. I know it's, oh, and all right, direct chat. I, I, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so yes, yes. So direct chat person and all of you. I'm still accepting any and all homeworks. I am like, it, again, was certainly revisions on homeworks. I certainly am for all the remaining points. If there are homeworks that you have not turned in at all, if there are homeworks that you never turned in at all, even including the very first one, yes, I will still accept them. But, but it's true. If it's for the first time you're turning it in, like you never turned in even a draft, I will still accept this is to everybody. I will still accept them until I tell you otherwise. But the farther back we go, like if it's the first one and we've like fully already discussed it and exhausted it and everything, I'll still take it. But right, you won't get all the points, but you'll get enough to be worth it. I, I mean, I, and honestly, well, anyway, yeah, you, you, yes, I will. Okay. And at a certain point I won't, but I will. Um, okay. So please, yes. It's And, and well, what I was going to say, what I honestly think to everybody is if you have fallen behind in the homework, it happens to everybody. The science may, like, I'm not here to judge at all. If you've fallen behind, my one piece of advice is as you fall farther and farther behind, honestly, in a class like this, I would almost say what you try to do is catch up backwards. Like if you have not done homework four, five, and six, it'll be better for you in the long run in a million ways to try homework six first and then if you're like really like it's stressing you out and even if you're looking at the class notes and the class videos and all that kind of stuff and you're still like, I have no idea what this means, which you wouldn't be alone, right? Then go like, well, maybe I'll understand it better if I look back to homework five now and keep going like that. Like work backwards if you're behind. For a thousand reasons, I can explain personally if you want, but work backwards if you're behind, okay? Also, you'll get more points that way because the farther back you can't turn in a homework, right, the bigger the penalty would be. So I hope that makes sense that, oh, okay, no, great, great. I see the direct chat, great, okay. So we're gonna move on now. I mean, of course, if there's questions about any of this at any time, again, remember, yes, you do need to show up to class Wednesday. Professor Liu will be there to particularly clarify and strategize and maybe do a board meeting with regard to homework number seven, 
uh, uh, sorry, homework number eight, Newton's laws. And that's what we're going to begin right now. So I'm switching the view on the screen. Bear with me. Okay. First thing I'm going to do. Well, this is a shorthand. What you see on the board right now is a shorthand for the structure of today and, and, and for the big picture on Newton's laws. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is literally just give you the three laws in my words to write, written down for you to also write down. You want to know the three laws. You want to know them as law number one, law number two, law number three. I mean, they are the backbone of classical physics. I'm sure you've heard them in high school, possibly middle school, but you've probably heard them kind of in different words at different times. So let's all get on the same page and know what the three laws are before I even start expanding on their meaning. So um, uh, here we go. So as I'm writing them down, it's, it's sort of pleasant to note that Newton, as you may know, British physicist, in some ways, in some ways, the, the father of classical physics, it, it, to the extent that Galileo is the grandfather of classic physics. It's interesting. Galileo, of course, worked and lived in what we now call Italy. Newton lived and worked in what we now call England. It's a little bit pleasant to note that Galileo died in, in the year 1642. And on Christmas of that year, Newton was born. Just interesting side note. So, um, so Newton lived from 1642 to 1727, and he wrote a ton. He did a ton of work, um, the, way beyond these three laws that I'm about to uh, mention to you, and they are from a, an enormous, the influential tome known as the Principia Mathematica. Within that book, he establishes three laws of physics after establishing a whole bunch of definitions and observations um, and mathematical underpinnings. So here they are. Sorry, sorry. I mean, that's correct, but I'm saying the wrong word. Okay. Um, the first law, I'll just read it out in English. Again, I know you've heard this, but let's let's be on the same page with the way we're going to word it in this class. Unless acted on by a net external force, an object... Oh, wait. Oh, oh right. I'm sorry, I'm looking in the chat. Right, Newton... Well, wait. Okay, okay, hold on a second interesting thing in the chat like newton did not know galileo personally no they were lived in totally different countries and yes one died and then the other was born that's number one but number two oh believe me newton was aware of galileo's work if that's what andy's asking i mean i, I don't know what, which one she, she she certainly knew who he had been and we'll get to that in a minute and then also it's interesting what gabriel just uh, what gabriel sorry what gabriel wrote in the chat Okay, he did. Yes, he was directly influenced by Galileo's work, as was Einstein, in a huge, explicit way. Um, we'll get to like they both absolutely credit their understanding of the universe, like to Galileo, in a big way. Now, also, just quick, and I'll get, I'll reread the on Gabriel's thing. 
if you're really paying attention to this class so far, it'll almost seem like Gabriel's contradiction to me or that one of us is wrong because what I flew through a second ago is there is controversy. There is historical controversy about Newton's uh, birth date, birthday. Um, and partly because records are differ on this and there, there's different and calendars actually have changed somewhat since then. So it's a little bit confusing. Yes, many people say he was born on Christmas of, I like to say he was born on Christmas of 1642. There is some reason to believe that his actual date wasn't until a week later, right? Like around New Year's of 1643. And so Gabriel's not wrong and he's not crazy. I and mean, then presumably he just looked it up. Well, he's not crazy or wrong, but there is controversy surrounding this. And yes, I guess I spiritually prefer to say that he was born before the end of 1642. I guess that's my bias, but it's more that I want to believe that than I can actually prove it. So yes, Gabriel's fair point. There is controversy surrounding that. Um, but okay, now as to the influence of Galileo. So what this says, Newton's first law, and again, I'm going to try to give you all the laws before I get too bogged down in um in um strange noises. What this says for my handwriting, it says uh, Newton one, Newton's first law of motion. Not that should be right there. I'm sorry. I mean, because he had a lot of laws. I mean, he had the law of universal gravity, so, of gravitation, et cetera. So I guess technically this is Newton's first law of motion. It says, unless, unless acted on by a net external force, an object at rest stays at rest and an object in motion stays in motion in a straight line at constant speed. That is a mouthful. If you need me to repeat it or decipher the handwriting, which is terrible, I'm happy to do so. Um, but notice a couple of things about this. Notice one, this is a condition. It starts with a condition. Notice two, it then once the condition is met, it splits into two cases. Again, I apologize for my handwriting if you can't, just tell me if you can't. But I'm saying if you look at the law, look at it as like a tree. The trunk of the tree is a condition. We're only talking about certain situations, objects that are not acted on by net external forces. Then it splits into two cases. The case of objects that are sitting still, like when you happen to walk in and look at them to make, to make an observation, and the objects that are already moving at that instant, when you happen to walk in and look at them, okay? You as the experimentalist, you as the researcher. So it's a law that narrows the world down to the trunk of a tree and then splits that trunk into two branches. Somehow note that in your notes, please. But before I go any further, wait. Um, no, all right, so I wanna say a lot more about it, of course. But before I do, let me just get the other laws on the table so that we can all be clear. So that's the first law. In short, it's the law that tells you how objects, how we expect objects to act when they're not being acted on by net external forces, which really means in English, ultimately, I said too much. This is the law that tells us what we expect of an object if it's by itself. This is the law that tells us how we expect solitary single objects to move when they're not interacting with other objects. In short, what I'm implying, what I'm saying that you might wanna put in your notes is that by net external force, what we ultimately mean is an interaction with another object. So this, okay, so this first law says, this is what we expect, this is like the baseline. This is the type of motion through space and time that we expect of an object if it's isolated, if it's not interacting with other objects, okay? That's what this law is about. Then the second law, I 
simply says this. Okay, so very briefly, the second law, the second law now tells us what will happen, what we would expect of an object that is being acted on by net external forces, by any amount of external forces, which really I'm telling you, and again, you may want to write this down. Whenever I say external forces right now, well, a force is some kind of influence, right? We haven't defined it yet in a specifically physics way. It's just a word in English that Newton expected that people had some sense of. And the loose sense of the word force is influence. And the, right? And the loose sense of the word external force is influence from the outside. So again, what I want to emphasize, emphasize right now is whenever you hear me say external force, and please do write this down, like somehow external force means influence from the outside, i.e. means influence from another object. Okay. And if I say net external force, like I did on the page prior, if I say net external force, I mean the sum of all external forces, the sum of all influences from all objects outside of the one that we're focusing on. In other words, please write this down. Net, when I say the word net on this page, and I, and I say, or I say sum of on this page, they ultimately mean the same thing. They mean, they both mean add up all of the influences happening from other objects, add them all up. And what this law says is they will then produce an acceleration of the object they're acting on. Once you've added up all the forces acting on a given mass, once you've added up all the forces acting on a given mass, they will produce an acceleration of that mass instantaneously. So at the moment that a bunch of forces are acting on a mass, that moment the mass will accelerate at a rate that is in that is directly proportional to the sum of all those forces, right? That this is a now this is a very mathematical law, as you can see. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um when I say add up all the forces, and I say that that means the same thing as net external force, the reason that sum of S-U-M-O-F and net mean the same thing is that, as you note from the arrows written in this equation, this is a vector equation. It's a vector equation. So it says our CGPR form number five, meaning remember from everything we talked about with vectors in the last topic, Vectors take into account direction. So vectors take into account minus signs. So when I say add up all the forces acting on an object, I might, I very much mean like 
add up all the forces, but take into account minus signs. If there's a bunch of forces pushing to the north and a bunch of forces pushing to the south, the ones to the south will get minus signs. So you'll add them up together. And in effect, it'll look like subtraction almost, right? Like uh, if you have five Newtons of force acting to the north and three Newtons of force acting to the south, when you add those together, you take into account a minus sign. So what you'll get is a net force of two Newtons pushing to the, right, good direct chat person. I saw that, yes, exactly. And you should definitely submit for points, direct chat person. Yes, yes. So like five to the north plus three to the south makes two to the north, yes. That's part of what those arrows are meaning to imply. And again, that's why if I say sum of, if I say net external force, I really mean the sum of all the forces, but you've got to take into account that sum often it really looks like subtraction when you take into account minus signs, right? Okay, but also please note GPR form number five that you used a lot in the last exam, that when I say this is a vector equation, what it really means, it means it's it can be, it can apply to more than one dimension at one time. It really means some of all the X forces equals the X acceleration times the mass while at the same time, all the Y forces together produce a Y acceleration and all the Z forces produce a Z acceleration. All, in other words, any in three-dimensional space, any one vector equation, okay, the board is frozen. There's a, it looks like a typo, but it'll pop in in a second. There you go, okay. Um, 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 any vector equation when applied to three-dimensional space really means three equations occurring simultaneously, but independently, right? Like that's form number five. So I'm just, again, this is like overview, overview. Of course, I know you've heard these laws before, but I'm just trying to give you the big picture and how they're going to apply to this class. The first law is like the baseline, the case of natural exp of the natural state of motion of an object, what we would expect of an object if it weren't being influenced by any other object, right? That's the first law. And I guess to say what the first law says is, all right, if an object's not being influenced at all, then it, then two cases, case one, if it happens to be sitting there, when you walk in and look at it, it'll keep sitting there. Not a surprise to most people. But then the second case, a little bit more interesting perhaps is, but if the object happens to be moving when you walk in, if it's if it has an instantaneous velocity, so it has the speed and some kind of direction within three-dimensional space, then when you walk in and see that and start taking measurements, you take out your stopwatch, you take out your ruler, and you start like well, or a video camera, and you start watching what's going on, what you'll notice, if the object is truly not being influenced by any other object, if it's truly not being pushed or pulled, by any other mass or dragged by the friction from any kind of rug or something, blah, 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 then if it happens to be having a velocity at that moment, it will continue to have that same speed and that same direction, i.e. move in a straight line at a constant speed until or unless it ever becomes influenced by another object, right? That's So the first law is objects in motion stay in motion at straight line at constant speed. Objects at rest stay at rest as long as they are not influenced by another object. So then we say, well, what happens if they are influenced by another object or a bunch of other objects? Well, that's when the second law kicks in. And the second law is much more mathematical looking. And in fact, the second law is what we tend to really use directly and explicitly for problem solving from here on in in physics. So the second law says, if some mass, some object with mass, some mass, some particle is influenced at all, by any number of forces, what you do is you immediately look at the situation in each dimension independently. And in each dimension, you say, all right, I'm gonna add up all the forces acting on this object, take all the pluses and all the minuses, put them together and the net effect, the overall sum of all these plus for it. And again, once you look at one dimension, you only will have pluses or minuses to distinguish direction, right? Like within a dimension, Directions either that way or it's that way or whatever. So the second law says add up all the forces acting on a certain object within a certain axis, take into account the minus signs, whatever is the leftover net force the, in a given direction that will produce an acceleration 
in that direction. And the magnitude of the acceleration will absolutely be directly proportional to, to the net force on the object. And what's the constant of proportionality? The amount of mass that the object has. Um, in fact, I'm going to say, okay, that's, a, again, the brief, obviously we have to do problem solving and stuff with this. I mean, we will for the rest of our lives. Problems are solved directly with this law. One other thing just to bear in mind. I'm just trying to think of this because you go on the next page. Um, I'll do it on the screen. I'll just write this a little bit neater. That's all. Okay, number. so just two quick notes on this. One, what I already said, I'm just writing it out clearly, like F net equals MA is a vector equation. It's very important to realize that. It's kind of why we spent so much time on vectors, like leading up to it. So it really is, if you're in three, if you're in two dimensional space, then it's two equations that are simultaneous yet independent. If it's three dimensional space, then it's three, right? Um, and you must take into account minus signs. One second, sorry, sir. Um, second of all, uh, second of all, the down below units wise, because now we're this is becoming mathematical, right? Now, so we have to keep, but it's science, so we have to keep track of any one of these quantities. Now refers to measurements that would be made in the lab. Um, so, so the unit of acceleration is meters per second squared. This we know from all of our prior work. And in fact, again, I should say all the work we've been doing, it's been sort of leading up to this in a big way. Our big study for the last month and a half has been what is exactly the relationship between velocity and acceleration? What what is similar and what is different about the two of them and acceleration. So in some ways we've been like really trying to study instantaneous acceleration um, as an effect that we were observing and measuring. Now we're finally getting to see what is the cause of that effect. We're now trying to like up until now, we've just been looking at things that are moving. We don't even really know why or care why we're just like taking snapshots and saying, okay, this is moving that way. So what's going to happen in the future to it? Now we're saying, well, why was it moving that way? And the answer apparently is because it was forced to, well, if something was accelerating, the answer is it was forced to accelerate. So, so much of our study has been to like focus in on the A, the instantaneous acceleration of an object. We know from our past experience that that is measured in meters per second squared. Well, masses are things that, could have such acceleration. Masses are measured in kilograms. I mean, in the metric system, they're measured in kilograms. One kilogram is one unit of what technically from here on in is going to be called inertial mass of an object. And we are saying from here on in 
that the net force exerted on a mass, on an object, the net force acting on a mass produces an acceleration of that mass that is inversely proportional to that mass's mass, okay? So one kilogram of inertial mass times one meter per second squared of acceleration gives the units of force. And from here on in, the units of force are called Newtons. One Newton of force is one kilogram of mass times one meter per second squared of acceleration. I'm gonna say one more thing about that and then move on to the third law. Please note, and please note this in your notes. And again, just remember, anytime you write anything down in notes that I don't literally write down, you can screenshot it and submit it for points. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Um, Cause like, that's a good thing to do. So so here's the thing I'm gonna say, but not write down is, is again, in the knowledge, that you've probably heard F net equals MA a million times in your life, I'm sure. But it is a extremely fundamental and powerful and subtle law. So we're here in this class to unpack and, and, and sort of reckon with some of these nuances that may not have been clear before. One of the nuances of Newton's second law is who's doing what to whom and what's the effect on what, meaning, when we say one newton of force equals one kilogram of mass times one meter per second squared of acceleration, what we mean is it would take a newton of force acting on one kilogram of mass to accelerate that kilogram of mass at an instantaneous rate of one meter per second squared. In other words, the correct way to look at Newton's second law is think of a bunch of forces acting on a mass and then say to yourself, oh, I guess the mass will accelerate at a certain rate in response to these forces. And I guess the heavier the mass is, the less it will accelerate in response to a given force, right? What we're not saying that heavier, but we're not saying that people often think, I'll just say this once because we're not saying that heavier masses have bigger forces. We're not saying that. And we're not saying that heavier masses exert bigger forces. The mass is the recipient of the forces as this law is written. The mass is the recipient of these forces. It's not the actor, it's the actee. Oh, so what? Yeah, so I'm looking at the direct chat. So yes, very good, direct, uh, direct chat. One Newton of force is exactly equal to, is defined as one kilogram of mass times one meter per second squared. Actually, I, I think this is just a typo or it's hard to do superscripts in the chat, but I think you mean meters per second squared, but yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, fine, fine. So yes, but... Well, we'll do, we'll say more about this, but I just what I don't want you guys to think it's not saying the heavier you are, the more force you have. Like, in fact, if you're really listening to me, and you'll see this as we play, you nothing has a force ever. It's not a force is not a oh, yeah, uh, yeah the, or the more it speeds up. Okay, okay. I guess I'll say this since there's good things happening in the direct chat. And again, obviously, this will become certainly this will become more concrete, like once we start solving problems and stuff. But what I'm really saying is that a force, think of a force, a force is an influence from another object. So more specifically, and you can write this down too, and you will probably in a minute when we do Newton's Theory Law, what really a force is, is a push or a pull, okay? A force is an interaction between two objects. So with this second, so the first law is telling you what happens when an object is by itself and not interacting with a second object. This second law is starting to tell you what will happen if an object is being influenced by other objects. Okay, and what I'm really trying to say in English is that the harder you, something, the harder something pushes a mass or the harder something pulls a mass, then the more that mass will accelerate given how much mass it has. So, so I'm saying if you have a given mass, like, 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 like here's a given mass right here, I push it a certain amount. Let's say I'm the only game in town. I just like push it to the left, then it's going to accelerate to the left at a certain rate. Like, so if it's right now, if it's sitting still and I start pushing it, it'll start speeding up at a certain rate. 
if it was already going that way and I push it to the right, then I'll slow it down at a certain rate. Like by pushing it, I accelerate it. Wait, wait. Okay, now again, I like what's happening in the direct chat and it's more than one person now, by the way. So that's great. So I'm just trying to keep up. Um, I, I see the, wait, wait. Okay, okay. So this is really good. So now there's things in the public chat too. Okay. You know, I, I think this is great. And I think this is exactly what we need. And also, of course, you can ask this. So you know what I want to do, though? I totally want to answer this question. If I do nothing but answer these kind of questions, if more questions come in the chat and I do nothing for the next, um, whatever, half hour, then answer these questions, it'll be totally worthwhile. In fact, I'll feel better than if I'm just lecturing. So I'm going to answer every one of these questions. And if more come in, I'm going to answer more. Because I absolutely believe at least three people in the room are asking can we visualize this better? Like, what are you really saying, Yavrabam? So you know what I want to do? In order to do this, in order to answer your questions and make this even more clear, let me at least, let me, uh, not at least, let me just get the third law out because what's strange is this is a package and it, it goes in order kind of, but it's actually, a f no, 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 you're, please, you are not, even if I sound, you're not, I like it better when there's questions. I mean, I get more frenetic, but because there's more to do, but no, 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 no. Please keep the questions coming. And this is a perfect day for it too. All I'm trying to do is lay out the law so you have a concept and so that you can at least start to engage in homework next. I want you to have a visually clear note. And especially because I know people have heard these before. So it's not about memorizing them. It's about like, what do they really mean? So this is a perfect day for q and I mean, I, I, I'd like to think I, that's always true, but you, please don't apologize for the questions. And please, those of you who are not asking questions, take this as encouragement. What I'm going to do right now is just write down the third law so you see the whole package and you see how it fits together. And then it'll make it easier for me to answer all these questions. But again, please... If more of you hop in with more questions for the next 25 minutes, if all I do is lay this out sort of an address, then that would be a great use of today. Plus everybody's tired. So it's it'll keep you awake more. Like it's perfect. Don't apologize, please. I reject your apology. I accept your questions. So, but what I'm going to do in order to answer the questions better, because I see them. And again, many of them are direct chat people and like some are, are Annie's. Um, let me write down the third law because it'll help me answer the second law questions better. So hold on, here we go. Third law. And this one you've heard a million times, but I'm gonna write it maybe very differently from the way you've heard it before. So, yep, sorry. We're about to be interrupted briefly by a certain member of my progeny. Okay. I'm going to work with mommy. Okay. Oh, that's awesome, guys. Okay, pardon me for a second. Oh, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm being there. Oh, you're even taking Wow. Yep. Okay. Great, guys. Have a great day. Family hope adventure. You can, of course. Oh, family invited. <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay. you. Love you guys. Oh, okay. No, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. That was well, you okay. Um, it's part of my uh, um, Okay. Couple of, okay. 
So first of all, this is the third law, and I have to do a second page. Oh, thank you. No, that's very nice. Thank you. Yeah, my um, I love my family, and um, they're always sweet in front of the camera. No, 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 they are. They're a lot sweeter than I am, believe me. Um, although my, okay. Anyway, that ten-year-old son that you didn't just meet, but you, I'm sure he will come on camera at some point. He is um, he's very sweet for a caveman, uh, for a feral, overly fortnighted, overly YouTubed member of this generation, but okay, yes. Um, um, uh, law number three says this, uh, sidebar, you may have heard, you've heard it a million times in your life, you may have heard it as for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Thank you for the laughter. Uh, and that this is that law that you've heard before. Every action is a, for every action. There's an equal and opposite reaction. But there's a very specific reason that I don't write it that way. And um, I'll expand on that. But to, I, if anything, I'm asking you, please learn it this way as well, because you'll learn the law much better. Ultimately, it's not anyway. So the way I write it is when, whenever, when object A exerts a force on object B. So if, those are arbitrary objects, right? Any two arbitrary. When one object exerts a force on another object, then necessarily, definitely, automatically, object B exerts a force onto object A of the same exact magnitude, but in the opposite direction. In other words, okay, in, in other words, In other words, first of all, if I push you, you push me with exactly the same strength. And of course, in the opposite direction, if I push you, you push me with exactly the same strength, necessarily, automatically. Like you don't try to, you just do. And and that even means if I put, and I'll expand on this, but just to be clear, if I push a wall, like even if you don't see or you don't think you see the pushback, or even if you don't see the effect of the pushback, like even if you can't measure the resulting acceleration so easily, or even if the resulting acceleration is really small because the masses of the two objects are very different or something, if I push a wall, the wall pushes me back with the exact same strength. And what's evidence of that, by the way, even if you don't see the wall move, my hand certainly hurts, right? I mean, that's a quick, so, it, so, so that's number one. Number two, So number two, they're simultaneous. It's not like I push you and then after some time delay, then you decide, oh, I'm mad. I'm going to push you back. It's not that. It's saying every push or pull is a coin that automatically has two sides to it. Okay, that's what we're saying. And what we're really then saying, and this is why I stalled on some of the questions in the chat or I'm stuck because what this, so, so this law says every force is a tug of war. It's either two simultaneous pushes going like this, or it's two simultaneous pulls going like this. And, and push means away from and pull means toward, like in English. So what we're really doing here in the third law, oddly, is we're really finally defining what we mean by a force. Even though that's funny, it comes third for a variety of reasons. But here's where, in order for me to circle back to number two, what we're really saying in the third law is
What we're saying is, and please, if you're taking notes or when you're taking notes, this third note that I just jotted down, what this really is, is the working definition of force from now on. Hold on. What we're really saying is from now on, what it what a force is, is a symmetric interaction between two objects. A force is a, a, an interaction. It's when one object affects another object. Ultimately, when one object affects the state of motion of another object or contributes to the overall effect on the state of motion of another object. A force is an interaction between two objects, much like velocity, you can't have a force if you only have one object. It literally doesn't mean anything. A object never has a force. An object does a force to another object. And when a first object does a force, exert, we say exerts a force onto another object, then the other object automatically at the same time is doing the force back to the first one. And a force is a tug of war. In, in super informal English, a force is always either a pull in two directions or a push in two directions. Always. And there's nothing else that a force is. A force, so if you just want the straight up, like just most casual English, a force is a push or a pull that I do to you and you automatically do to me. And no one decides it. No, it doesn't matter who thought of it first. It, there is no first. It's a symmetric interaction between two objects. That's what a force is. Now, again, I want to spend most of the rest of the time just circling back and answering these questions. But I want you to notice something now. If um, this may sound familiar, right? Notice I keep saying like a force, it's like velocity. It's not something that a single object can have unto itself. It's something it's how one object relates to another. Velocity is how the motion of an object gets compared to the motion of another object, right? Galileo, Galileo, Galileo. A force is how one object affects the motion of another object, right? So both of them have this similar quality of being relations between pairs rather than properties of singletons. Okay, and it's not a coincidence to go back to one question, like when Annie asked, like, do, was Newton aware of Galileo's work? Oh, yes. And in fact, let me say, let me say that Newton's first law, if you really think about it, in fact, let me, since there's a second page for each of the other laws, let me, let me bear with me for a second. I am trying to get to the questions. I promise. Um. Okay. First of all, I'm going to write it in neater handwriting because it's so. Okay, so that's just in neater handwriting to make it clear. Um, but but here's the note.
Okay. What Newton's first law is really saying is Galileo's principle of relativity. This is the sixth form and explicitly. Like what this is, is Newton saying, wait, Galileo is really onto something. Oh my God, Galileo is really onto something. So much so that Galileo is making us realize we've been wrong for centuries about the second case of this law. Like what, okay, and again, I gotta be careful. I wanna get back to the second law and get to like Annie's and direct chat people's questions. But just notice this, in the first law, the, the case, one of it is not the surprise. Like when things are sitting around, they continue to sit around, right? But then what people often think from case A, especially the, in modern times, when everybody's talking about energy crisis and oil crisis and, and peak oil, and like there's this assumption that people tend to, and, and we live in a world that has a lot of friction in it, right? So what it tends to seem like is that objects that are moving, what they naturally do is slow down. It tends to look like if you don't force an object to move, it won't. If it's not moving already, it'll continue to not move. But it tends to look like when objects are left alone and they're moving, they will eventually naturally just slow down. And what it looks like is that it requires help or outside influences to keep objects going. Noon says, oh, no, wait a minute. That's not the case. We think that because what we're often observing in the regular world is objects in contact with other objects, such as wheels on a rough road being dragged by friction or something to, or, or things to that effect. We see the effects of objects on other objects a lot, particularly in the case of friction. If we were to really isolate a object and get it away, like, or put a hockey puck on a super smooth ice skating rink, or a hockey puck on a super smooth cushion of air on top of an air hockey table, right? Or, God forbid, or going to outer space where there isn't air, which of course became possible like hundreds of years after Newton, but, but the other two came, anyway. <clears throat> Or, or what Galileo showed us is on a track, you put an object on a track and the object moves to a certain distance before it slows down and comes to rest. But then you smooth out the track and make a little less friction. The object goes a little bit farther and you smooth the track out and make even less friction. The object goes even farther, takes even more space and time before it runs out of velocity and comes to rest. If you take that idea to the limit, which Galileo showed us how to do physically in a process that he called successive approximations. But now Newton is doing in his mind with this whole new world of calculus that he's invented or discovered that's based on taking these ideas to the limit. He says, well, wait, right. Galileo's right. If I kept smoothing that track down and really, if I had the technology or I can imagine the technology to get the track so smooth that there's, I would watch the trend, the less friction, the farther the object goes before it slows to rest. So if I took away the friction from the other object called the track entirely, then the object would go forever in a straight line at a constant speed. Newton's saying and inferring from Galileo, but more specifically Newton's saying, oh yeah, that's just the Galileo idea. The original Galileo principle of relativity says, it says, that at rest is just in the eye of the beholder. That velocity is not something an object has. It's a comparison to another object. So if you really take Galileo seriously, then nothing is itself at rest. It's only at rest compared to another object, right? So whatever would be true for objects at rest better be true of objects not at rest because any object that seems not at rest, if I run alongside it and make observations, now it's at rest compared to me. Right? So if you really take Galileo seriously, so if I believe hockey pucks should not just spontaneously start moving to the right, and I think we all believe that, and Aristotle believed that, and everybody believed that for hundreds of years before, thousands of years really, before Galileo and Newton. If you believe that it's unnatural and weird for a sitting cup to just spontaneously start going to the right, well, then that means if if there is a cup that's moving to the left already, like a hockey puck on ice, and I run alongside of it and take measurements and take photos, like and I videotape it, or I'm on an earth with it that's already moving 
to the east at 65,000 miles an hour, right? If I'm watching this object, then from my perspective, it's at rest. If I don't think an object at rest should spontaneously move, then I, I don't think that the object that I'm tracking along with should spontaneously do anything new, like start moving. Therefore, that means it's, from your perspective, you see the object going like that, right? I'm with it. So I think I've got a video camera on it. I think it's just still. I don't think it should do, I don't think it should change spontaneously. Well, you're watching us both and you're not any more correct than we are, but you're watching us both go to the left. You don't, then therefore, if I don't believe that that object, it's a hockey puck on ice, right? I'm tracking a hockey puck along, going along on the ice. I don't believe the hockey puck should just spontaneously start going somewhere. You, therefore, should not believe that the hockey puck would just spontaneously start slowing down, right? I mean, if I don't think the hockey puck should just start moving to the right, from your perspective, that means the leftward moving hockey puck should not just spontaneously start slowing down. Uh, think that through. But I'm saying, ultimately, and I, I, of course, I have to move on. I'm saying Newton took Galileo so seriously that he's like, oh, my God, all speeds are just perspectives, there's nothing special about the speed zero. That's not something that planet Earth has or any object has. That's just a comparison to other objects. So whatever we, in other words, Newton's dividing this into two cases to really say, if you really take Galileo seriously, the result in both cases should be the same, which is if no net external force is acting on you, then you shouldn't change your velocity. Whether your velocity is zero or something else, that's just in the, there's nothing special about zero. So objects that are unforced should not accelerate. They should maintain constant velocity, whether that's zero or something else. That's, so I'm saying Newton's first law is really Galileo's principle of relativity form number six. And in fact, I'm then saying that Newton's third law I'm really saying that Newton's third law is really just a definition of force. And it's saying I'm saying that to really understand the third law, you're really just again understanding this. It, it's the same idea as GPR form number four, only now applied to forces rather than velocities. We're saying it doesn't make any sense for me to push you without you necessarily pushing me. I, If you really understand that a force is an interaction between two objects, then it has to be a symmetric, mutual interaction between the two objects. It doesn't matter who thought of it first or something like that. In other words, you, you say my family's cute. Thank you. Okay, my wife, I married her. I'm not trying to be weird, but Yes, yes, very good direct type printing. It's automatic. Yes, just like this. And it's almost like a language thing. It's like, this. It's, it, we're saying a force is a relation between two objects. It's not a property that one of them has any more than the other. So it's literally like saying, I married my wife on October 20th, 2012, whatever, right? October 20th, right? I married my wife on October 20th. Guess what? You want to hear something really weird? You want to hear a crazy coincidence? My wife married me on October 22nd. I'm not trying to, I am being sarcastic. Like that, obviously that's not weird, right? Obviously it's not a coincidence that my anniversary date is the same as my wife's because that's what it means to marry someone. Like you can't marry someone without them marrying you, like for good or for bad, right? For, to death, to, that's what a force is. You interact with another thing. You push another thing. So it automatically pushes on you. It, it You can look at it from either perspective. Both perspectives are legitimate. That's okay. So I'm saying, I know I'm running out. I've got six minutes. I'm saying this is totally Galileo, just blown up into the land of interactions, not specifically interactions and accelerate. Like Galileo was all about what velocity means when it's constant. It's literally all about what velocity and motion means really when it's constant. What does it mean? It means it's a relation between two objects, not a property of one. Now, Newton comes along and says, but what about when velocity is not constant? How about when things are like changing, when they're accelerating? Why or when does that ever happen? The answer is when they're forced to by other objects. When an object interacts with a second object, it interacts mutually, reciprocally, symmetrically, and it produces accelerations. Newton's first law, what thing, what happens when there's no net external force is just an expansion of Galileo. It's just saying, dude, the zero, whatever you believe 
about objects when they're sitting still that you believe they wouldn't naturally change their velocity? Newton says, well, that's got to be true of even if it's non-zero velocity, because zero was just a matter of reference frame in the first, it was just a matter of perspective in the first place. So Newton's first law says velocities don't change unless they're forced to. That's what the first law is. This third law says, what's a force? A force is a mutual push or pull between two objects. That's what the third law says. Now the second law mathematically, the one that we really use directly for problem solving says, the second law says, okay, so when there is, when there is a net external force on an object, on a mass, the mass will accelerate at a rate that is directly proportional to that net external force. So going back now to the direct chat, the questions, I mean, there were a couple that I didn't, let me see. So visualizing it is the main thing I think that's being asked of me in the chat. I'm sorry, I'm just looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know we have four minutes. Why would a force cause acceleration? So, okay. And by the way, stop me at any time. If, if somehow you feel like the question has been answered, right? Just let me know in the chat. But, but yes, I'm looking, I'm particularly looking at Annie's number one, because it's public. And I think it captures what was also going on in the private chat. Like, like, why would a force cause acceleration? Well, the why, if you're really asking why, I'm saying the reason is because, because the natural state of objects is to not have acceleration. Like, like, I'm saying, I guess what I'm really saying is there's no, there's, since there's no, okay, I'm saying there's no special velocity. That's the key to take away from Galileo. There is no special velocity, including zero. Nothing is actually at zero, nor does anything therefore want to be at zero, right? Be, so, so what I'm really saying is objects don't have any reason to try to change from one velocity to another, since no velocity has any special properties that any other velocity doesn't have. So if an object is left alone, it just stays at whatever velocity it happens to be at. Oh, wait, wait, I'm looking. Yeah, objects want to be, I'm looking at the chat again. Objects naturally want to be in their natural state, which is whatever velocity they were a moment ago. Whether that you call that zero or you call that seven or you call that the speed of sound totally depends on how you're looking at it. So velocities don't want to change the velocity, but if you come along and so with the visualization for the next two minutes, oh, cool. Yes, the initial, that's right, that's good, yes. So if you come along and you push or pull, if you are a second object and you come along and you push or pull the first object, then you will change its velocity. You will accelerate it instantaneously. You will either speed it up or slow it down or turn it. Like So the best way to visualize, I guess with two minutes left, the best way to visualize sort of all the three laws as a package is picture a hockey puck on like an air hockey table or, or, or on a, an ice hockey rink, like a super smooth. So the air, like once you just walk in and you're seeing an air hockey puck that already happens to be gliding along. If it's gliding along at some speed in some direction, it will just continue to do that until it's affected by something else. So it just goes along in a straight line until it bangs into a wall, at which point, they, in fact, it's a perfect example because the hockey puck is going, 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 and then it bangs into a wall. What I'm arguing in the third law, so first law says it'll just go, 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 straight line, same speed. Then it bangs into a, a wall. The third law says, well, if it bangs into a wall, the wall bangs into it. There's just no two ways about it. So the wall, so it's going like this, the wall hits it like that. So it was going north, the wall, exerts a force to the south. So what does that mean to the hockey puck? It means it will start having a southward pointing acceleration, but it was already moving to the north. It's like big old duck. It had a northward pointing velocity. So it starts accelerating to the south. That means it starts slowing down, slowing down, slowing down until it comes to rest, all the while still touching the wall. This all happens very quickly in the case of a wall, but it's slow down, slow down, slow down until it comes to rest. And then it keeps losing velocity, keeps getting velocity into that negative direction. So it starts speeding up, speeding up the other way, as long as it's in contact with the wall. So the wall turns it around. It slows it down 
or if you catch something, whatever, it slows it down and then reverses its direction and forces it, accelerates it in the other direction until the puck is released from the wall and now it goes back to that's the simplest, fastest way I could say right now, because I know it's 12.05. We'll talk more about this. The ultimate way to visualize all this is what's with called system schemas and free body diagrams, which I believe is a big part of the next homework. So just try your best. Just do something. Look up on the web, whatever you need to, about free body diagrams or system schemas if it asks you to. Just try your best and hand in something, and then we'll talk more. And you'll talk with Professor Liu, and we'll be able to hand in more later. Uh, but let me know next class if I visualize that at all for you. But it is 12.06. So have a great night. I'm hanging out for a second to talk to anybody who needs to talk, but I'm turning off. But thank you and have a great night. I'm stopping.